Thank you very much, Harry. Okay, hey Alupa. Um, we taught it playing as um, So um, I'm Julian, um, and as Harry said, um, thank you for the introduction. I'm now at uh, New York University. Um, I came here yesterday to talk at the Games Now series at Alto University. Um, and I gave a one and a half hour talk there about, you know, things I do. So today I'm going to give a half hour talk um, about things I do. So I decided to basically cut out lots of stuff, but actually I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about a lot of things in half an hour. So it's going to be pretty fast. And, uh, but the good thing about this is that hopefully you won't fall asleep. Um, and uh, afterwards, um, you can ask me about more about the details. I'll stay around for coffee and chatting and so on. So let's go. So introducing myself quickly, I went to school in Malmö in Sweden and I, where I grew up. And I, I was terrible at maths and I decided I would never want to do anything that involved any kind of mathematics again. I'm still terrible at maths. Um, I don't know very little about it. So I studied philosophy and psychology to understand the mind, but that didn't really get me anywhere. I decided that in order to understand the mind, I needed to build the mind. So I sort of gradually segued into computer science. I went to Sussex in the UK to study biological inspired artificial intelligence. Essex in the UK for my PhD to do evolutionary robotics and discovered I didn't really want to do robotics either because I don't like hardware and fiddling with like screwdrivers and oil and stuff like that. Um, so for my PhD, I sort of switched more into games, figured out that games are fantastic test beds for AI development, particularly video games. And around there, I also figured out that you could use AI to make the games better in various ways. I went for a postdoc with um, Jürgen Schmidtuber in Lugano, um, uh, where I learned a lot about what the upcoming deep learning revolution. Um, and then I worked in Copenhagen, and now I'm at New York University. And while I'm still interested in some of the fundamental philosophical questions, almost anything I have to do, I, I do these days, um, um, concern games in one way or another. So AI for making games better, or games for making AI better. And these things really fit together, as you will see. Um, starting from the start, artificial intelligence. Um, what is it? I used to basically start from a very simple definition. It's basically about making computers able to do things which currently only humans can do. Now, you might wonder, games, what do humans do with games? And if I ask people, literally every time, 10 out of 10 times, people, people say, well, humans play games, which is true, humans play games. But they do a lot of other things as well. I have lots of colleagues that study games, to try to understand them in a way you would understand art or literature or buildings or whatever. Um, then they explain them, they teach them, they create content for them. You see so many, so, so many levels for um, uh, and worlds for uh, Starcraft or Minecraft or whatever craft or Little Big Planet and so on or Super Mario Bros. available online, fan made. And of course, humans design and develop games. Um, um, the Helsinki region has some pretty strong games industry. Some of you might even be working in it, but um, <clears throat> um, this is um, um, a big and growing economic segment, creating games. Um, in AI, people have been focused on playing games for various reasons. So let's start there, and then we're going to get to some of the other topics, AI for doing some of the other things with games. So you must play games. Um, and um, using AI to play games is um, uh, a good idea because games are designed to challenge your minds. Games are fun because we learn to play them as we go along, or at least that's one very important reason why they're fun. Um, they are designed to, so that when you start playing them, you get a challenge, and that challenge ramps up as you get better. The various, very, very diverse types of games that are available also challenge our minds in very different ways. Look at like the different kinds of cognitive capacities you need to play Flappy Bird compared to Final Fantasy, compared to Grand Theft Auto, or some text adventure game, and so on. For this particular reason, is also why they're ideal benchmarks for AI, because they challenge, they are fun because they challenge our minds, 
and uh, therefore they test something which is relevant for replicating or understanding human intelligence. And they also have this ramp difficult scale, which is why it's great to teach AI agents to play them that way. Of course, I wasn't the first to rea um, realize this. From the very birth of AI, back from Turing, people consider chess one of the greatest um, AI challenges. This is John McCarthy, AI pioneer, playing chess against a computer the size of a room. Um, then we have Gary Kasparov in 1997, losing. He was the reigning world champion of chess, losing against um, uh, IBM's Deep Blue computer, which was a computer the size of a room, um, which was state-of-the-art at the time, um, which um, uh, sort of put an end to this long quest for coming up with human competitive chess players. And people wondered, what's next? We thought that chess was sort of the epitome of intelligence because it is about planning, long-term planning, it's about outsmarting an opponent, um, and it's sort of the core of what intelligence is. But then someone comes along and builds a computer, which is essentially just like a fancy search algorithm, the software of, D of Deep Blue, and it wins over the best human chess player in the world. But it doesn't really have a, any kind of real intelligence. Maybe chess was the wrong game. People focus on Go, the Asian board game, which is harder for various reasons. It's a high branching factor and it's harder to um, see how good a game state is. And then two years ago, we had um, Google DeepMind's uh, AlphaGo algorithm implemented in probably a computer size of a room, winning over Lee Sedol, one of the world's best Go players. And he's now firmly entrenched as uh, having superhuman Go cap capability. So sort of AI for game playing is sort of done, right? We're done with all these games. But that's not true, because playing board games is this tiny, tiny part of everything you can do with AI in games. Partly because it's not only about playing games, but partly because board games is a very, very small part of uh, what games are, and arguably far from the most interesting part. So let's play video games instead. Let's see what we have here. From left to right we have StarCraft, which is way harder than Go. Um, it's, it's, it's way harder and way more interesting and has m much more interesting challenges in different ways. Then we have Super Mario Bros, which you all know, you have all played Super Mario Bros. If you haven't, well, I mean, come on, go, go home and play Super Mario Bros. <laughs> um, and it is uh, also, there's been a long running Super Mario Bros um, competition that I started, or it didn't run for that long, but it was quite, quite popular for a while. It's very commonly used as an AI benchmark. And then we have Torx, a 3D racing game, which also been used. Uh, there, there was a pretty long running competition um, about racing in this, um, in this game benchmark. Um, so start with Mario. We um, started a um, competition based on a Java version of Super Mario Bros. back in 2009. This was originally developed by... Uh, the Java version of Super Mario Bros. was originally developed by Notch this Marcus Passon, this guy who later went on to create Minecraft. He got sort of famous and rich. And, um, uh, but back then he still answered emails. Um, and we um, came up with, a, we rebuilt this into an AI benchmark where you could submit your best Mario playing agents and, uh, and see which one would win. And what we found was, it was really, really disappointing because um, the first year we did this, just a few weeks before the deadline, someone comes along, Robin Baumgarten, who was then a PhD student at the Imperial College, comes along and submits this agent. And it's really, really disappointing because it's just too damn good. It seems optimal. Every time I show this video, people are absolutely transfixed because you look at this and if you ever play this game, you know that you can play this good. It's just amazing. It jumps off at the, at, at the last possible uh, pixel at every time. And it does things that there's going to come one moment very soon where, which will make you think that, no, 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 that's not possible. Um, and what's really sad about it, there. <laughs> what's really sad about this is that it's a super simple algorithm. There's no sort of fancy neural network. There's no sort of complex um, machine learning algorithm with lots of maths. This is A star search, which is um, an algorithm that you'd learn at first or second year when, when you study computer science. What it does is it simply plans forward in time and at any point it tries to reach the right end of the screen. 
and it uses the game engine itself as a simulator to see what would happen when it takes certain actions. So we tried to up the challenge a bit. We redefined the level generator so that it um, generates these levels which has its overhangs. So sort of to, to win this level, you need to go back all the way and jump up at the top of this um, little ledge. And as a human, you easily see that that's possible. The A-star algorithm constantly tries to sort of find the, right, um, the, the shortest path to the right end of the screen and ends up like spending all this time searching for very, very short-term solutions and never manages to win this. You can say it has amazing micro and really, really bad macro. Um, and when Harry talked about hierarchical learning before, this is uh, one of these great examples we need, hierarchical learning. Um, so next year, the winner of next year's competition was uh, the Realm Agent, which is um, everything that some people do not want AI to be. It's a mess. It uses A star search at a lower level, but it has a bunch of rules that decides where, where to use the A star search to, um, um, to go to. Um, and these rules are evolved by an evolutionary algorithm. Um, so basically using Darwinian principles to find good rules which can then guide the A star algorithm. Um, and it's so far the best Mario playing algorithm that I've seen. I've not seen anyone actually try to challenge afterwards. But um, it's, also, it's impressive for, for, for a number of different reasons. One of them is that it has nothing to do with the kind of methods that most people talk about when they talk about game playing these days. And also because it is, um, it is, it is a mess. It's a good mess. Since then, coming up with, um, coming up with like game-based AI benchmarks have been almost, almost turned into a bit of a sport. So everybody does that and everybody does the AM games for AI these days. There's these Atari um, uh, benchmarks that DeepMind have used uh, liberally. There's StarCraft. There's um, um, the Viz Doom, which is based on the uh, Doom first-person shooter from the 90s, and a bunch of other things. So there's a lot of research activity in learning to play games these days, because everybody has realized that it's essentially the superior type of benchmark. What you see a lot is people using deep learning for this. There's this deep Q learning algorithm, which everybody is very sort of, um, everybody is obsessed with and think that this is obviously what you should do. I don't know if anyone gets the movie reference here, but um, if you have not seen The Big Lebowski, you should. Um, it's almost as culturally, culturally relevant as playing Super Mario Bros. Um, so surely, Jesus Quintana says, deep learning, deep Q learning is the best algorithm for game playing. But well, that's just like your opinion, man. It's, uh, it really depends. In fact, there are so many different possible algorithms of game playing depending on what the game is. What sort of, uh, does it have like many different uh, actions at the same time? Does it have hidden information? Does it have, um, um, does it have stochasticity? And what kind of information do you have about it? Are you trying to play only from pixels? Which, is, which, seem, which many people try to do these days. If so, why are you doing that? It's a stupid thing to do. It's the sort of thing you do just to show other people that you can, but it has no practical, practical usefulness. It's like, you know, walking on, a, walking on a tightrope between two buildings because you can. Or do you have some other kind of information? Do you have a model of the game? So what Terry was talking about, about the AI that can learn to imagine, well, this really depends on you being able to simulate what you can do internally. And of course you should do that. If, you, if you're any, any possibility at all to simulate, um, um, to simulate the uh, outcome of your actions internally, you should do it. In any case, we had a question after Harry's talk, um, which was about general intelligence. And most of this game playing AI is massively overfitting to a simple problem. What Harry was saying was also that, you know, almost anything any AI we see today is a special purpose AI that can't do anything else. And this is, a, this is the case here as well. So the AI that has been built for playing StarCraft can't play Super Mario Bros. or car racing, um, and vice versa. So um, 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 what can we do about this? Okay, I'm not, on the next slide I'm going to show you something I'm a little bit scared of. And I really don't think these are the sort of things you should have on, on slides. Um, I think slides should be free from this kind of monstrosity. 
but I'm going to show you an equation. I honestly still hate maths, um, but this one is a good one. This is Shane Legg, um, who later went on to co-found DeepMind. He defines, him and Marcus Hutter defines universal intelligence of an agent as its performance on all possible environments, weighted by the inverse complexity of the environment. So basically, how smart are you? Well, to measure how smart you are, try how well you perform all possible problems in the world, and then weigh those that are simpler to describe higher. I think intuitively this makes a lot of sense. Unfortunately, it is impossible to measure in practice because you have to sum over all possible problems, which takes infinite time, and you have to weigh it um, by its complexity. So you have to calculate the Kolmogorov complexity, which is uncomputable. So, hey, you can say with some understatement that it's not exactly practical. But you can be inspired by this and try to formulate ways of measuring intelligence by playing many games. Because I do believe that if we have an AI that can play any game we give it within limits, we talk about anything that's on the top 100 of the iPhone, App Store and Steam, etc. and play it successfully after maybe a little bit of training time, then we do have something that is pretty damn intelligent. So with this in mind, we created a general video game playing competition where we created a special purpose language for describing simple two-dimensional arcade games. And then we let people submit controllers to this uh, competition written in Java. It currently, in the version that's been most popular, we give them no training time, but we do give them a forward model. So they get no time to prepare, but they can dream. And this is how one of these games look in this, com in, in this competition. This is a version of Zelda, um, or Overworld of Zelda. You run around, you collect keys, you fight evil monsters, um, you get to the end. If you let a random player play this, it will not do very well because it's random and takes random actions. So what works? Well, back in 2006, an algorithm was invented that really changed how people play Go. It's called Monte Carlo Tree Search. It's a stochastic tree search algorithm um, that has spread from Go playing into all kinds of different fields. It's now useful for industrial planning and all kinds of like every, in every time you need um, a, uh, you need to plan a process which may or may not have stochastic properties, but the algorithm essentially builds an unbalanced tree and does not need a good way of evaluating the state. Let's have a look at how the Monte Carlo tree search algorithm, or a version of it, does on this game. Um, it runs around, performs pretty well on a, in a micro case, has problem with looking far ahead enough to get to the door, but eventually does it. Here's in the same benchmark um, uh, Space Invaders implemented, which is um, not a very exciting game, but still playable. Um, we have a human trying to battle it out with these invading aliens and uh, eventually winning. I'm not going to show you all of this video. It's pretty, it's not super exciting. Here's a random agent taking random actions. As you can see, um, it's not doing extremely well because it's just randomly shooting, going back and forth, and doesn't even know how to evade these projectiles. Here's the Monte Carlo tree search agent trying the same problem. And it may look a little bit misdirected initially, but it's actually, it's actually doing this very, very well. So the interesting part here is not that we have an agent that can play Space Invaders. That's pretty trivial. The interesting thing is that when we started, the agent did not know it was playing Space Invaders. So we have more than 100 games in this framework, and you can easily apply any agent to any game, and you're supposed to handle it. And this Monte Carlo Tree Search based agent we see here does well on about a third of the game without knowing which one which ones it is from the beginning. Any one of you played Boulder Dash? A few of you? When I thought, yeah, nice, yeah. It's quite a few of you. When I when I spoke in front of a game crowd yesterday, basically that was basically everyone. It's a fantastic uh, 80s game that keeps being remade for all kinds of different consoles. It's um, 
nice because you um, it has a combination of long-term planning and action focused or twitch focused gameplay you need to dig away all that dirt and you can um, uh, if you dig away the dirt under a stone it will fall um, and you need to collect 10 diamonds so you can exit so you can exit a level however um, you can easily get yourself trapped so my PC student to record this, uh, this level is now figuring out how he's going to do this. He found this diamond and then exiting this thing. These monsters will kill you, by the way, as well. The random agent obviously does really badly here because it's taking random actions and runs around and gets himself killed by caving in. Um, interestingly, the Monte Carlo tree search agent doesn't do very well either. In fact... We don't have any agents that can reliably win all levels in this game. It does. It might seem simple, but it's actually because of the, this combination of Twitch-focused gameplay, some stochastic um, elements, and the necessity for long-term puzzle solving. It's actually very, very hard. So, is this the path through general intelligence? I would believe that this is a more plausible path than most other paths. Basically, gradually learning to play more and more games in the same framework, and eventually you can add more and more games that might have story elements, three-dimensional movement, and so on. And uh, I would say that if we have an AI that can play any game we give it, we have something that's pretty close to general intelligence, to the extent that something like general intelligence actually does exist, which I'm skeptical of, but let's try. So, let's move on. We talked about AI applied to games, and we talked about AI for playing games. There's a lot more to say about it, but let's think about other things you can do. We talked about playing games, people study games, they explain and teach them, they build content for them, they design and develop them. So one thing that has been a part of some games since the early 80s is procedural content generation, where some parts of game levels or other types of game content like items or vegetation or terrains or something are procedurally generated as you go along, starting with Rogue in 1980 and Elite in the early 80s, which were generating um, parts of the levels that you went along. This is now the basis of like game series such as Civilization, which completely depends on creating a new world for you every time, every time you, um, you play it. Or Spelunky, if anyone has played that, which is also based on this idea that you never play the same level twice. No Man's Sky, you have, might, might have heard about that. Um, the whole concept of the game is that you have an, for all purposes, infinite galaxy to explore. Because um, uh, there's, uh, there's just so much content and so much variety to explore. I think we're just at the beginning of what procedural content generation can do. I'm thinking about a future where we could have games that, you know, you play something like Grand Theft Auto, but you go like five hours in that direction. And you find new cities with new people in, with new quests to, uh, to complete, with diverse architectural styles, unique events that you no one has seen before, etc. Maybe they're actually adapted to you and, they, and the game has figured out what you, what you like and what you're good at and gives you more of that content. Maybe content you didn't even know that you wanted before. And this will help us understand not only make better games, but also understand how um, how people think and how game design works in various ways. So I've been working a lot on trying to make more ambitious procedural content generation than what we currently see possible. So one of these methods is using search-based procedural content generation. So using artificial evolution, so essentially Darwinian evolution, algorithmic form, to search for good game levels or the types of good game content. What you need then is a way of representing the content, representing um, what, what you have, such as levels or items, so that you can search the space of game levels, for example, and you need a way of evaluating how good they are. Evaluating how good the game level is is obviously not trivial, because how would you do it? How can you write up an algorithm that can tell you what's a good Super Mario Bros. level, for example, or what's a good StarCraft level? Some of you are already thinking about this right now, as I'm saying it, like, hmm, we need balance in the StarCraft level. Maybe we need to have um, a simulation that 
like that tries to play the Super Mario Bros. level to see if it's playable and maybe we can see how much Mario jumps to make sure there's enough gaps to, to jump over or something. Right? These are all good suggestions. I see you're thinking about it right now. Um, and um, you can actually take this all the way and, 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 and develop complete um, rule sets of games. There are people, um, Cameron Brown, for example, is a researcher that actually managed to publish board games that are compl have completely automatically generated rules generated by evolution, which is very impressive. But let's take a simple example. Let's go back to Super Mario Bros. Um, because we've seen Super Mario Bros. before. So one of my PhD students figured out that if you cut the Super Mario Bros. levels in the original game up in little slices or columns, then you can see that there's a lot of repetition. So you basically listen to slice one, slice one again, slice two, slice one, slice three, and you can represent the whole level as essentially a string. Then you can search these strings, the space of these strings, and you can find those that have the most sort of unique design patterns. Like here's like a three stage where you like um, a three way where you can go below, in the middle or above. Um, there are pipe valleys, so valleys between pipes, enemy hordes, etc. And then you can find levels that have, search for as many levels, have as many of these patterns as possible um, available to you. And you get, you very easily and very quickly get levels that have a lot of local structure, which has a lot of interesting playability challenges. Like, as it is, they're fun to play because there are lots of li little problems to solve. And then you can vary where you want these um, patterns to appear. Maybe you want um, a level that starts with relatively few patterns and, and sort of ramps up to have more and more of them. So you have a relatively good deal of control and you can quickly get any number of Super Mario Bros. level you want. We've been going on with this. So basically some very recent stuff um, from our lab. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with bullet hell games. These are shooter games with an extremely large amount of bullets on screen. Um, here we have in the system called Talakat. Um, we um, have a language, we devise a language that describes these boss monsters. By the way, you play as a Laos and you're trying to invade a wig. Um, so it's a lousy game. Um, and, uh, and you change this description language and you get new patterns to sort of fight against. Um, these can be automatically generated and the evaluation function is simply that you play, um, that we have an, um, a player based on a search algorithm that tries to solve these levels. And we can vary how, sort of, how, how far ahead the search algorithm can look and we also vary how much noise it is and how it, in, in how it plays. So that we basically look at your strategy capacity and your, and your dexterity. So we can create levels that need high dexterity, but low strategy, or high strategy, but low dexterity, or high, high, low, low, etc. So you sort of create levels that automatically fit a particular type of player. These things can be automatically um, learned from your gameplay as well. So you can learn someone's gameplay style and learn to produce new levels that actually fit. This is like a pattern that looks bad, but actually is very easy because you can find a place to stand without moving, essentially. Another thing that we've been working a lot on is trying to use the real, the real world, because the real world, there's so much data about the real world. You can look at Wikipedia, open street maps, any kind of demographics databases, at United Nations databases, and try to fit this um, into, um, into, um, into games. So come up with ways of using AI to automatically create games based on this real-world data. So Data Agent is a um, adventure game that we um, have been working on for a while in several different iterations. It's based on Wikipedia. So it's the, the, the overall story is that you are an agent sent back in time. It's some kind of Star Trek-like scenario. You're sent back in time to find a killer because some other time traveler has killed a famous person. And you have to travel around, ask various suspects, and see who is not telling the truth, who is contradicting what the others are saying. And the whole game is generated from OpenStreetMaps and Wikipedia. So you, f you select who to kill, in this case Albert Einstein, and, you, and there's a number of people you encounter, you have to ask them things, where they're from, what do you say about the other people, and uh, eventually you'll find someone who is, who is clearly saying things that are 
inconsistent with what the others are saying, and that's probably the, cul um, the culprit, so you can arrest them. Um, uh, I can tell you lots of anecdotes about the absolutely weird stuff that this um, uh, game generator sometimes comes up with, and the stuff that have, have made us very reluctant to actually release the code, because people People are so sensitive, have you noticed? Um, and even if it's an algorithm that doesn't actually try to insult anyone, um, but, but, but still it comes up with very, very odd scenarios sometimes. Um, uh, Can you give an example? Oh, it had... Uh, <laughs> we, had uh, we had it at some point, um, at some point in one of the games you met Hitler and he had a certain opinions about uh, one of the other people who, who was suspicious because it was a Jew. Um, we also generated, uh, at some point you visited a police station and, and it was accompanied by a nice picture of um, policemen beating up the demonstrators in the background. Apparently this was, what, oh, oh, these pictures come from Wikimedia Commons, so yeah, apparently this is what a search term gave, um, came up with. So, um, final example here. This is a final? Second final, yeah. I need to finish soon, so almost final. You can generate, um, um, you can generate um, game content and the computer can generate game content. How could you co um, communicate with each other and sort of collaborate on something? So Sentient Sketchbook is a system for generating strategy game map sketches that tries to let you retain full control of what you do, but also um, but also give you feedback all the time on what you're doing and uh, help, you with, um, help you with suggestions so as to sort of combine the best of procedural generation and human editing. These, um, what you see here, it looks, might look like big chunky pixels, but it's, um, what we're looking at here is map sketches and we have a way of translating them later on to strategy game maps, such as StarCraft maps. So we create, um, bases, resources, unpassable areas. We have lots of metrics that tell you what, what um, parts of the level are accessible from what other parts of the level, which resources are safe, um, what the balance in terms of resources is, and, uh, um, and so on. And, um, um, and it's constantly giving you feedback about this. On the right side of the screen, it also has a number of suggestions. So these suggestions are updated whenever you, whenever you edit something. And they are trying to basically, they're taking what you're editing right now and trying to pull it in different directions. Some are just trying to introduce variation. Some are trying to make it more equal in terms of resources or maybe less equal in terms of resources. Some are um, making it more accessible or less accessible, etc. So you can select a map suggestion at any point, replace what you have with it. And the system tries to learn your preferences. Ah, this particular user seems to want to want maps to be like this. So then I'll generate things that are more like that in the future. Um, and then you can export this to, um, uh, to various formats, as you can see, including StarCraft, which is, yeah. Um, final, final example. Um, tutorials. How do you learn to play a game? Well, someone needs to teach you to play a game, or the game needs to teach you. So once you develop the game, there's a lot of effort that goes into coming up with a way of making the game tell you how to play it. And uh, we thought about, could you generate this somehow? Could you sort of automate this, this thing? So you input the game, and, it, and the system plays the game and figures out um, what kind of different things you need to do and then tells you in a nice sort of schematic form, like you need to do this, you need to do that, and give you like visual demonstrations of it as well. So this system here is built on the general video game AI framework, so which has the advantage that we already have a number of good agents for playing the games, and we also have um, the rules in a nice parsable form so you can understand them and reason about them. So the Zelda game you saw before, this is an example of a generated tutorial about this. It tells you what things you need to do to get points, um, how to lose, how to win. And um, it shows you a little, demos, a little animated um, video of each of the actions you need to take. And this is like captured from an AI agent playing the game. So basically we first reason about what kind of different things are necessary. 
And then we use an AI agent to play the game to sort of find all the situations. We, 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 and, and then we show little videos of what did the agent do to, to sort of make this possible in each, each of the situations. This is very, uh, very current work. We're submitting it tomorrow to a conference. Finally, to sum up, what do we have here? Well, what I'm claiming is video games are the perfect test beds for AI. This is not even a controversial claim anymore. It was when I started, but many people seem to have realized that this is simply how it is. Because their video games are made to challenge the mind, and uh, they are perfect because they can teach you gradually to play them. What is important is working not on a single game, but working on games in general, so general video game playing, if you are interested in general intelligence. AI is also the future of game design, because I didn't even speak about that, but testing games is super important. Some of the big game studios have realized that now and are working on this. Um, and this will revolutionize game design. Um, generating content is something that has been a, um, a part of some games for three decades, but there is so much more to do with content generation that hasn't been done. There's so much many possibilities for automatically generated parts of games. Generating tutorials is something that might be important. And there are lots of other, there's like, there are lots of other things that I didn't have time to talk about today. If you're interested in knowing more, um, we have a textbook specifically about the procedural content generation in games, which from, came out two years ago. And we have another one that just came out um, about artificial intelligence in games, which is about everything I talked about today and much more. Um, both of these are available online for free as well, and you can buy them from Springer in, in uh, hardcover. Um, um, and if you plan to teach this, for example, this is also definitely, um, they, are, they are meant as textbooks as well. And we have a summer school on AI for games, which takes place at the end of May. Um, unfortunately for you Finns, it's um, on the island of Crete at the end of May. So it's terrible weather, dreadful food and so on. But, um, but if, if you're ready to put up with that, that I, can I can totally recommend going there. We'll have talks from a number of uh, game companies and um, AI companies, as well as me and my colleague will be giving a thorough course on this. And that's it. Thank you.